Finally, it falls upon me to invite onto the stage to close the case for the opposition, British journalists at the Daily Mail and a recent um, uh, biographer of the, of the royal family, Robert Hardman. Thanks very much, uh, <coughs> Mr. President. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for, for being here this evening. Um, I, we've heard great points on uh, both sides of the debate tonight, I think. Um, and, uh, and, and rather like uh, uh, my opponent, uh, Dr. Ellie, I, I come here tonight principally taking issue with the word mere. Uh, I, I think uh, there's no question that, that monarchy uh, has a connection with celebrity. It goes without saying. But it's a byproduct of, uh, of, of monarchy. Celebrity it comes with the institution. Um, the, the, the system of monarchy is, is one that uh, this country has been broadly happy with, with the exception of a sort of 10-year headless hiatus uh, about 350 years ago, as has been discussed. Uh, but on the whole, the large, large majority of people in this country are entirely happy with the system of constitutional monarchy, which is why no political party will go anywhere near it. Uh, and I think to say that monarchy is all about celebrity is a bit like saying that the Oxford Union is all about dressing up in this sort of kit. I mean, it sort of goes with the territory, but it's not what it's about. Um, so I, I emphatically say monarchy is not about celebrity. Now, you probably think that's probably a bit rich coming from a Daily Mail hack, um, uh, uh, particularly one who actually is on, uh, on countdown tomorrow sitting in the celebrity chair. So uh, I, 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 you know, full, full interest declared. Um, but I, 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 as well as uh, writing for the paper, I write books, I write documentaries. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote another book and interviewed Prince William about the Queen. And he came up with a, a very good point, I thought, where he said, uh, talking of the Queen, he said, she cares not for celebrity, that's not what monarchy is about. Um, and it really is the case. I mean, royals don't do stunts. The Queen absolutely hates stunts. I mean, this is the Queen who once, on being presented with a draft copy of a speech which began with the line, I'm very glad to be back in Birmingham, crossed out the word very uh, on the grounds that uh, it was no disrespect to Birmingham, but she somehow felt that it smacked of insincerity. Uh, probably the only stunt that she has done, and we've all seen it, it was a great, great one. It wasn't really a stunt, I mean, it was a very important moment, uh, was her appearance in that spoof video with James Bond to open the uh, 2012 Olympics. I, I happened to be in the stadium that night writing about it. I can tell you I was surrounded by uh, thousands of journalists from all over the world who were all, frankly, a bit baffled by Danny Boyle's somewhat eccentric, though brilliant, stagecraft. And then suddenly, oh, thank God for that. There's James Bond, there's the Queen, we get it. And that, the next day, that was headlines around the world. It wasn't London Olympics open, it was Queen jumps out of helicopter with James Bond. Um, so, uh, Going back to the celebrity point, I mean, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I've just written a, the Queen's biography. Uh, I won't even name. I won't, I won't plug it. Uh, it's in the, I think it's in Blackpool's. Uh, but, uh, but, but in the course of writing this, I was able to talk to uh, half a dozen of her prime ministers, presidents, people who work with her, people all around the world. Uh, I was. She, she gave me access to some of her papers, her father's diaries, and, and I think if you really want to understand her read her father's diaries. Uh, I was also lucky enough to use freedom of information uh, legislation to, to dig out some classified documents, not least fascinating one on the 1982 visit by President Reagan. I think it's really interesting because uh, here's Reagan, newly elected president of the United States and a celebrity, let's not forget, film star, governor of California, boy is he a celeb. Uh, he's coming to Europe for the first time as president and it's a really big trip because he's coming to a NATO summit, he's coming to a G7 summit, he's going to meet the Pope at the Vatican, he's coming to address both houses of parliament. But what this uh, file I managed to get my hands on uh, shows very clearly, and you read all the diplomatic traffic between Washington and London, Downing Street and the palace, the thing that matters more to the White House, more to Reagan than anything else on this entire trip is riding in Windsor Park with the Queen. That's what really matters. And don't forget, at this very moment, Britain is at war in the South Atlantic with, the, with, with Argentina over the Falkland Islands. We need America on side. So you, you really can. You can draw an absolute line between Queen, Reagan, <coughs> Ally, and the victory that was soon to follow. Now, I mean, that is 
a, a form of power that we've talked a lot tonight about power and what power the Queen does and doesn't have. We haven't touched on what I think is her key power, and that is soft power. We live in the age of soft power, where influence and charm and persuasion are far more important than coercion. You can get a lot more done by winning people around than by driving tanks across their lawn. Uh, and I, in the course of this book, I interviewed a great man, Professor Joe Nye of Harvard University, the man who invented the concept of soft power. Uh, and he was absolutely clear about this. He said Britain's two number one soft power assets are the English language and the monarchy, and specifically the Queen. And, and I, think, uh, I think it was Richard uh, uh, referred to her state visit to Ireland. I happened to be on that trip in 2011. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, we've talked about things in the, in the past, and it's all a long time ago. No, the visit to Ireland was really, really quite recent. And it was an astonishing bit of statecraft, and it was absolutely soft power with bells on. Uh, it reset the dial completely. And what it showed, what it showed was that, that sense of permanence, that sense of continuity that, 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 that the monarchy brings, that the Queen brings. She did more in those four days in Ireland, I can tell you, than politicians did in the previous 40 years to reset that dial. Uh, and, and, and while I was doing this book, I, I interviewed, I was able to, the great thing about lockdown, by the way, is that VVVIPs are stuck at home. They end up having to talk to people like me about the Queen. So I managed to get hold of George W. Bush, former president of the US, man who, probably the president who knows her best, because he knew her when his father was president and then when he himself was president. And he made the point, he couldn't get his head around the fact that the Queen has met and known 14 presidents. He said there's absolutely no one ever anywhere in the whole world, including America, who has met and known 14 presidents. It's almost a third of the entire total. Uh, and and, and that, that soft power, it's why Obama, President Obama, just weeks after that extraordinary visit to Ireland, the Obamas came to stay at the palace. I was lucky enough to cover that as well. That was extraordinary. And, and Obama had no truck with the Cameron government. I mean, you know, the White House and Downing Street were not particularly getting on, but the Obamas came to the palace and it was absolutely hit it off. Obama loved it. So much so uh, that when I interviewed George Osborne, he reminded me about that, that evening when the Queen came up to him at the end of the state banquet. They're having drinks afterwards and the Queen said to Osborne, Mr. Chancellor, could you tell the president it's time to go to bed? Because uh, it was well past her bedtime. And Osborne thought, Christ, what do I do? Uh, got the private secretary to gently nudge the Obamas off to bed. And, and I spoke to Obama's right-hand man, Ben Rhodes, who was with him in the room of the sort of after party back in the, in, the, in the Obama suite. And Obama was just humming, buzzing. He absolutely loved it. Just sitting there, he couldn't even concentrate on the speech he was supposed to be doing the next day because he just wanted to talk about the Queen. And it wasn't starstruck. It wasn't celebrity. It was a fact that she could talk so ably about all, her pre, all, 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 all his predecessors to him, uh, the, the fact that she'd made him very welcome, what she represented to so many generations. He was completely struck by it. And right in the middle of this sort of peroration by Obama, suddenly there's a sort of knock on the door. Uh, and it's a footman going, I'm frightfully sorry, Mr. President, but there's a mouse. Uh, at which point he goes, don't tell the first lady, she hates mice. And Michelle Obama's getting changed in the next door room. So, I, 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 it was a completely surreal moment. Uh, the other surreal point about all this, this is coming from uh, his right-hand man to me, was that the palace is the only place the Obamas ever stayed where they didn't have an ensuite bathroom. The Belgian suite at the palace, to go to the bathroom, you have to go down the corridor. So here you've got the most powerful man in the world. He's been kicked off to bed early, and in a, in a, in a, he's staying in a room with vermin. Uh, you know, if he wants to go to the loo, he's got to walk down a corridor. You'd think this was not really great diplomacy. And yet for Obama, Obama absolutely loved it. They had a great relationship with the Queen right the way through his presidency, who was the first world leader to fly in on the day after her 90th birthday to wish her a happy birthday, Obama. And right at the end of his presidency, he made an extraordinary speech, actually, where he discussed the entire essence of leadership in the world today. And he picked out two great leaders of his lifetime. And one was Nelson Mandela, and the other was the Queen. So going back to this point, is it celebrity? No, it goes far beyond that, far beyond. And, and, and the same with Prince Charles as well. I was at the COP26 last year. To be, I spent a day with Prince Charles, just sort of following him around in the background, watching all these world leaders queuing up to talk to him, to meet him, to thank him. I was in the room when 
Joe Biden came up and hugged him and said, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you and what you've, what you've fought for. And Prince William, we've talked about that trip to the Caribbean that some people have said is disastrous. I mean, that's the standard sort of Twitter narrative. It was a disaster. Uh, I, I spoke to people who were there. It was not a disaster. The Bob Marley Museum in Kingston were thrilled after a pandemic to have some celebrities. And don't forget that they were not there because they're propping up some crumbling throne or they were on holiday. They were there at the invitation of the government that invited the Queen on independence to be head of state. It's not a case of the monarchy clinging on. And for precisely those reasons we've heard tonight, why did all these countries, whether it's whether Jamaica or St. Vincent and the Grenadines that voted to keep her in a referendum very recently, why did all these countries choose to have the monarchy? It's not because of, you know, they like having the Queen and they think she's lovely. It's because it's that power that stops the overmighty politician getting their hands on the forces, the judiciary, the honour system, the civil service. That's what monarchy is about. That's, that's what soft power is. At the end of his reign, King Farouk of Egypt famously said, one day there'll only be, or very soon, there'll only be five kings left. King of clubs, diamonds, spades and hearts, and the King of England. He wasn't quite right. There's, uh, there's 27 monarchs still left. They exist for a reason. Monarchy does work. Look at the UN Development Index. You'll find that in the top 10 and the top 20, even though the vast majority of countries in the world are republics, half of the top 10 and half of the top 20 are monarchies. It's because of stability, permanence, and continuity. And it's got nothing to do with celebrity. I beg you to oppose. Thank you.